I'm very happy waking up today. Um, Northwestern football got their first Big Ten win in at least 600 days, if I'm correct. Since October 2021, when they beat Rutgers, Northwestern beat Minnesota yesterday, 38 to 34 in overtime after being down 31 to 10. And before I get into, into that, for my videos, um, I'm at least a week because of how busy I am. I'm going to try to get uh, something like around the horn where it's pretty much me just talking about all my teams and just like what I'm noticing. Um, But yeah, so this is going to take 10 minutes at most. I'm going to talk about, it's actually funny, like I'm in a new scene, Um, but this is my mirror and you can see I'm going to talk about Northwestern, the Rangers, the Jets, and the Mets, and then the little cousins too. And I'll be really fast with it. So starting with Northwestern. So Northwestern football improved to two and two on the season, already passing their win total from last year when they went one and 11 with Pat Fitzgerald and they beat Minnesota and PJ Fleck. They lost, um, last week to Duke 38 to 14. And this week they beat Minnesota after being down 31 to 10 and they came back in overtime. So here's a few things from the game. One, just statistically amazing games for some cats, right? Ben Bryant's best game as a, a Northwestern quarterback. Of course, it's a very short Northwestern career, but 396 yards, four touchdowns. The last quarterback to put up a stat line like that was Trevor Simeon in 2013. Bryant really put the team on his back. And obviously when you're down that much, you're going to be passing more. And you couldn't do that without your weapons. And um, with all my coverage of the Northwestern football team, and I haven't really gotten into anything on this video, I talk about Northwestern's weapons because they do have a revitalized weapon system or wide, a wide receiver core, at least, with A.J. Henning transfer from Michigan, Cam Johnson from Arizona State, and Bryce Kurtz is the lone returner. And Bryce Kurtz yesterday, it was a long time coming for him. He had um, over 10 receptions, 215 yards, two touchdowns. And in all, a lot of my articles for Inside NU, I talk about this wide receiving core, and I talk mainly about A.J. Henning and Cam Johnson. After Northwestern's loss against Rutgers, which I was at, I asked Ben Bryan, I'm just like, what's your relationship with A.J. Henning and Cam Johnson? And I forgot Bryce Kurtz. And yesterday, Bryce Kurtz was the best receiver on the field on both sides. And it's just so good for him, too, because of all the injuries he suffers. And he was out the first week of the season and coming back. And just like being able to really push through and stuff. And he said in his press conference, it felt so good and the team's so happy for him. Um, a few more stats. Cam Porter continues to impress. Obviously, he's not Evan Hole, but he had third, 14 for 56 and a touchdown. That gets the job done. And yeah, just statistically, a lot of good cats had a game. AJ Henning, touchdown in the third game, in his third straight game. That's huge for him. Obviously, coming over from Michigan, he continues to be the best player in the cats offense. I'll say that and I'll mean it. Um, and obviously he scored a touchdown with two seconds left off a dot from Bryant, where Bryant did such a good job pump faking Tyler Newbin, who's a first round safety. And I'm not only saying that because Northwestern beat Minnesota, Ben Tyler Newbin's a first round pick. And um, but Ben Bryant picked him off. Henning was open. Henning made a great catch with a defender on his back. So goes into overtime. The Northwestern defense gets a stop and then they win on a touchdown to Charlie M Mangieri on the first play of their drive. OK, so now without even statistics, a few things I want to talk about. One, common theme for Northwestern, resilience. It's been that throughout the summer. It's been it throughout every game this season, resilience, and it was on full display yesterday. Northwestern, like, you can't sugarcoat it. Northwestern had a really bad summer, and I'm not going to go into it, but head coaching change. A guy brought in to be a defensive coordinator. And his first FBS coaching job is now the head coach of a Power 5 team, and not only a Power 5 team, a Big 10 team, which has really good coaches, including P.J. Fleck, who was on the other sideline last night. P.J. Fleck's been at Minnesota for I don't know how long, and this was David Brown's first Big 10 game at home, and he coached the lights out, and it all comes down to resilience and the idea of never wavering. And in every media availability I've been at or every coverage for Northwestern football since the summer, they've talked about this idea of resilience with the lowest of lows and just getting to some sort of high. And they needed a good day. And yesterday was that good day. And it was their second one of the season. And it's just that idea of resilience. And all the players were saying it and all the coaches, they never faltered on that sideline. And they said they were going to win this game, even when they were down 31 to 10. And I think a lot of that comes down to the talent on this team and how like stuck together they are too because last year too there was some enthusiasm with that but they couldn't get the job done and just seeing it happen yesterday against a Minnesota team that really owned Northwestern over the past two years it's just really great to see like last year I was in um Twin Cities like for Minnesota Northwestern Ethan Kalik Manis who's the Minnesota quarterback only passed for 60 yards but Minnesota ran for over 300 and they beat Northwestern 31 to 3 the offense couldn't do anything four quarterbacks in that game one got hurt, obviously, or a few quarterbacks got hurt. Then um, two years before, uh, Northwestern lost 41-16 to 16 in Minnesota in that same field. 
You can see the steps forward statistically and resilience wise. And it's going to be the common theme for Northwestern. And I'm talking them up a lot right now. And I, I'm not I'm not trying to say that this Northwestern team is going anywhere. I still look at their schedule and I see their ceiling being five games at most. If I had to guess, I'd say four and eight, three and nine. Um, I think they'll beat Howard for sure. And then Purdue and Illinois are toss ups. Besides that, there's a lot of hard games. But it's just about that idea of staying together and building on that talent and building on that program. Because Northwestern's not an easy job. Um, it, And it wasn't an easy, easy job before this summer. You're still the smallest Big Ten school. You're still the second smallest school in um Power 5 FBS. And yeah, it's um it's a tough job, and you're playing the likes of Ohio State and Michigan and Minnesota and and the Big Ten West. And the Big Ten's only going to get harder, remember, because USC, UCLA, Oregon coming in, Washington too. Those are literally the four best teams in the Pac-12 probably, and um maybe Utah, but that's regardless. Um, doesn't matter. And just like it's a hard job, but getting a win that's so huge for this program, and I really can't ex- state it enough. And just that idea of resilience. And now the the Northwestern plays Penn State, who's an insane team. They're going to move up in the AP poll, probably into the top six. They play them on on Saturday in Evanston. I'm really excited to go to the game. I'm excited to be at media availability tomorrow. Just see the, the morale for this team. And they needed a Big Ten win, and they got it. And they're 2-2. Two and two, And it just shows a big step forward from this team. Are they making a bowl game? No, probably not. And I'm not expecting them to. But getting a Big Ten win against a team that really had their way against you and against a long tenure head coach, that's a big thing because in Northwestern's other Big Ten game at Rutgers, they just did not look the part. And yesterday, they might not have looked the part for two, a half, but then they came back and they won. And that's what matters. And one of the best quarterback performances in Northwestern history. And is Brian the guy? I mean, like, he might be. Um, And he had a great game and stuff. I'm not saying, like, it, it was good for Northwestern. That's pretty much it. But, yeah, I just move forward. I'd still project project four and eight, three and nine. I do think the ceiling's five, but I'm just excited to cover this team and stuff. Because also one more thing before I shift my focus, when you're covering this team or you're around the football team, or even just being a Northwestern student, um, football's a losing battle um these days. And it's been since I got to Northwestern, um, because of the just the records and stuff. And now what happened in the summer, just these associations and stuff. And um, it's fighting a losing battle, and all the work a lot of people put in, it feels like a losing battle if the team goes out there and feels effortless. And while you don't have control about them, and sometimes they put in so much effort yesterday, and it was almost like a weight off a lot of people's backs, whether you're in the program, outside the program, or even a Northwestern student. Yesterday, um, the Northwestern students, the few that stayed, got to storm the field. That's going to be one of my biggest regrets at college. I left. Um, I left at halftime because. Northwestern was down 21 to seven or 24 to seven. And yeah, I didn't think the game was going to happen. And that's going to be one of my biggest regrets, but it's that idea of never faltering and being a Northwestern student, someone who covers the team, it just felt really good because fighting it could be a losing battle sometimes. And it doesn't feel that much anymore. So for real, go cats next happy New York Rangers game day. Even though it's preseason, I got my stuff on because I'm also going to work for the Cubs and Bears. Um, but just a few things to note about the Rangers game day. Preseason against the Bruins. Um, training camp just started. Peter Laviolette really seems to be a culture change. He's obviously so different than Gerard Gallant. Laviolette's a lot of X's and O's, strict, which is what the Rangers need with their um youth and their also just core. Um, Miko Zibanejad day to day with an injury, not too that much to say. And I'll go into a full Rangers analysis another time. Just it's game day, and um, I do think the Rangers have legitimate Stanley Cup expectations. I don't think they should enter as a favorite. I think they have a lot to prove, and I think they'll be making a lot of moves, and it really comes down to the kids. I'll get into a full range of analysis after, but happy game day. Those guys are my life. Really happy. Moving down the line, New York Jets. Jets play in, thir- in 27 minutes against New England Patriots. Um, few keys for me in this game. Um, one, zero, zero, zero. You got to break the streak. The Jets have lost 14 straight against the Patriots, and they all know it. They are all aware of this. And Garrett Wilson said it on a radio show. A lot of players get asked about it every time they play the Patriots. The Jets are the the New York Jets are a better team than the New England Patriots. Um, in terms of a talented roster, they're a better team than New England Patriots. They have more talent. Garrett Wilson's the, the best wide receiver. Uh, Garrett Wilson, Brees Hall, Dalvin Cook, even though he's been bad, those are the three best offensive players on the field. And I think um both are great defenses. The New York Jets really have um something to, something to prove today. And I think if they're going to take down the Patriots, it's going to be today. And here these are the two other reasons why. One, feed Brees. Brees Hall had four carries last week. He's getting back to full strength. I don't know if he'll be on a pitch count today, but the Jets are 4-0 and when they give him more than 10 carries. Give him more than 10 carries. This is a Patriots defense that when you run in between the guards and the center, their defensive tackles are not that good. They have really good edge rushers like Matthew Judon, who's one of the best in the league, but just run the ball. 
run it through Brees. It's also a really bad get like bad weather out. Run the ball through Brees Hall, um, more than 10 carries, and then let's hope Dalvin Cook does something. And the Jets have to be opportunistic with this too. And it also comes down to the Patriots are missing a lot of guys in their secondary. They're missing Jonathan Jones. Um, They're missing a few more that I saw in the injury report. They're thin. And the Jets also have a thin secondary, and we'll talk. I'll talk about it in a second. But, yeah, um, if you're going to beat the Patriots, you've got to start running th- through the guards and then be opportunistic and stuff. Because once people start keying in on Brees Hall, Garrett Wilson will get open against a weaker secondary because the secondary is weaker today. The Patriots, I have a really good secondary with Jonathan Jones, Jack Jones, Kyle Duggar. And, um... Yeah, but not today. Um, the New York Jets want to win against the New England Patriots and flip this script. It starts today. So, yeah. Um, and then last thing, last key, um, we're going to go with the defense, and I'm going to go in specific the pass rush. So, yesterday, Dak, or last week against the Dallas Cowboys, against an offensive line that's a little shaky, but they do have Zach Martin. Tyron Smith was out, but um, anyway, that's enough about the Cowboys. The Jets only had one sack, and this is uh, this is a pass rush that, provi- that really prides itself on getting to the passer and stuff. And – Dak Prescott completed 30 passes for 255 yards and two touchdowns last week. That can't happen, and the Jets defense is obviously pissed off. I just can't see the Jets defense against a much worse quarterback and Mac Jones doing that today. I think this Jets defense needs to get to the passer. Just get to Mac Jones' bull rush, whether it's Quentin Williams, Jermaine Johnson, Bryce Huff. The Jets dressed 10 pass rushers, including first-round pick Will McDonald, who wasn't active last week. They clearly are pissed off and they want to get sacked and start with getting to the passer and stuff. And this is a Patriots team, too, that isn't that talented in terms of the skill position. While I do think Ramondre Stevenson's a good running back, Ezekiel Elliott has nothing in the, ta- in the tank left. Their wide receiving core, Kendrick Bourne, Devontae Parker, um, Juju Smith-Schuster, just nothing really stands out against the Jets secondary that is not too healthy um, because um, Tony at starting safety, Tony Adams is out. So look at Adrian Amos today starting at free safety. Um yeah, I think you got to get to the passer, and the secondary will do its job, and well, it'll be interesting. But those are my three keys to the Jets. I really think if there's a day to flip the script, it has to be today. I think this it's not a must-win game because it's week three, but it's the closest that you are going to get to a must-win game early on in the season. Got embarrassed last week against a good team, lost your starting quarterback for the season, 14-game losing streak against a team coming into your building with the reigning Super Bowl champions play, coming next week, so – Obviously a tough game and it's hard not to look forward, but you two and one's a lot better than one and two. And if you're two and one with Zach Wilson as your quarterback, with the Jets schedule, you want to get to three and three in the six weeks. And then the schedule gets a lot easier, but obviously start today. So those are mine. And then last, um, going down, New York Mets got eliminated from the playoffs. Yeah, it sucks, but there are a few positives from the season. Like, it really was a hard Mets season to watch. There were definitely a lot of games they could win. They just didn't perform well. A few positives from the season. Kodai Sanga's an ace. Um, He's been so good. ERA under three. He should get Cy Young votes. Has been, quietly become one of the best pitchers in baseball. Um, And hopefully um, the, the Jets could get Yamamoto. I mean, not Jets. The Mets could get Yamamoto, who's this um pitcher from Japan because of Senga's success. And I know the Mets are going to be a front runner for him. Um, other positives in terms of player performance, Francisco Lindor breaking Mets shortstop records. He's keeps this up. He's going to go down as one of the best Mets shortstop ever. Gets a lot of unwarranted hate, but whatever. 27 home runs, breaking his own record. Um, Not over a hundred RBIs, but he's done that before. He's great. Um, Is he worth every penny? You can't say that until you start winning playoff game, but he's been great. And he is quietly one of the better one of the best players in baseball and was in the MVP race. Pete Alonso, um, over 46 home runs. He's a monster. Obviously, a lot of this offseason is going to be talking about the Mets and Alonso's extension. I do think they get it done right now. They're a part of years. Apparently, Alonso wants 10 years. The Mets want to do less. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm not really too worried about it. But, yeah, so there's a few more positives to this season. But, obviously, negatives, Um, a lot of them in the start of the season, whether it was – Lack of offensive production. Justin Verlander and Max Scherzer just not living up to the bargain. Obviously, they got traded to Houston and um Texas, respectively. Tommy Pham gets traded. A report came out the other day. The Mets are a, we're not a hardworking team. Um, I'm not going to get into that, but it was just a a rough season for them. And but there were some positives. And what I want to say: Will the New York Mets be a World Series contender in 2024? Probably not. But I do think they took a step forward by getting rid of those bad contracts. They're always going to be one of those big fish teams that a lot of players want to go to, even though it's New York. I bet not even though it's New York. It's New York, and even though they're the Mets and they they haven't had a lot of success, they're going to be a big fish team. And I think the Mets got so much better than their prospect pool. Um, 
this all and then but by the trade deadline they bring in Luis Angelo Acuna who's now their top prospect um they bring in Drew Gilbert Jet Williams all playing really well in the minor leagues and it's just good um I do I do think that there's light at the end of the tunnel for the Mets I do think that I don't think it would be crazy to say they're a playoff team next year especially if the prospects come along and the Mets have that offense production because they do have a lot of guys like Alonzo Lindor Jeff McNeil um Brandon Nimmo uh they have a bunch of they have players and they're, they're and Francisco Arbel, Alvarez. Look at the look at the baby Mets. I haven't even mentioned the baby Mets. Francisco Alvarez, Brett Beatty, Ronnie Mauricio, and uh, Mark Vientos. Like those four, if they all could take a step forward, then the Mets will be a scary team. Will they be a team that could contend for the NL East? Probably not because the Atlanta Braves are the best team in baseball and they'll continue to be the best team in baseball. But it's about taking a step forward, and I think the Mets could do that. Um, yeah, but that's pretty much it for me. Um. Yeah, um, Chicago Cubs are in the hunt, too. That's who I'm working for right now. They are um, tuned into Marquee Sports for all their coverage. I'll bring more. Um, follow my Twitter for more about Northwestern, the Jets, Rangers, really anything. But I really wanted to get this out. Really happy about a Northwestern win. Happy Jets and Rangers game day. And hopefully um, Jets get the win like Northwestern did last night. But thanks again, y'all. Um, more on the way. But follow me on Twitter.